This is the Ophthalmology Business Podcast, where we help you develop your ideal practice with the help of other doctors and experts. The topics we cover include marketing, management, leadership, recruitment, HR, mindsets, and more. I am Naren Arul Raja, the founder and one of the co-hosts of this podcast. Every listener to this podcast is welcome to join the Ophthalmology Business Academy at www.obacademy.org. The membership is on us and it's our gift to you. Today, I'm excited to talk to Guido Piquet. And the topic we're going to be talking about is leadership in tough times. Let's jump in. Before we get started, Guido, why don't you take a minute to tell us a bit about yourself? Who are you? How do you get into ophthalmology? Tell us your story. Thanks, Lorraine. And thanks for having me today. You know, ophthalmology really was a a surprise for me in my career, but it's ended up being something that I've started to get a lot of passion for and something that's taught me a lot of lessons in in my career Um, and sometimes the hard way. (laughs) But I think uh, something that, you know, at the end, I can say that has been uh, very enjoyable for me. You know, I I started, I'll just tell you a quick little bit about myself. Um, So I started in ophthalmology in 2006. One of my mentors, um, I actually started in technology for, uh, for in the Houston Medical Center. And one of my mentors was a friend of one of the ophthalmologists. And he told that ophthalmologist that he knew someone that could help come run his, his practice um, as the IT director. So I came into the practice, you know, didn't really know anything about the field, started to kind of give them some structure and set up, and then started to get into more of the operations just because I was part of conversations of planning and uh, strategy. And so I started to learn the business that way. And really, I think what helped me take the next step in the field was just the ability to show leadership, because I think leadership, it is something that is hard at times, um, because it, it there is a natural component to a leader. There also are components that can be learned. And I think that whatever it is that I showed, they decided to, to push me into the operation side which then I had to, again, learn <laughs> learn as a newbie from the ground up. And that was also very uh, challenging. So I'd say that was about 2011. So they said, hey, why don't you go one of these big practices? Don't worry, we'll help you get started. Um, and so I really dove in head first and just learned everything that I could from the staff. And one of the biggest things that I should tell the staff is, I don't know what I'm doing. We're going to learn this together or you're going to teach me and I'm going to teach you what I know. And I think that vulnerability with the staff kind of helped me to kind of win, win them over and, and get them to trust me and to follow me. And so for the next five years or so, you know, I learned that business and learned what to do, what not to do, learned a lot of lessons about leadership. And then, you know, the ability to show that, that type of culture, because culture and organization is, is very key. I was able to take on my next role, which is the chief operations officer for the practice that I work with. And then I've continually grown from there, working with different leaders of different locations. I have gotten more into strategy, bigger picture things like business acquisition and you know bigger things that we're taking on as a practice. And so that's just a brief history of myself. And it's been a crazy wild ride, but it's been very fun. Thank you, Guido. And by the way, I want to let our listeners know that you're going to be joining as a co-host. So you will be somebody that they will be hearing from. Just like I'm interviewing you today, Guido, you're going to be interviewing others. So I'm really looking forward to listening to your interviews. Let's jump in. So topic today is leadership in tough times. You have a lot of experience, you know, relevant experience in the ophthalmology field. You've been there, done that, dealt with these issues, and you have, you know, have a great track record. So I think our listeners can learn a lot from you. I know we are living in 2022 as we are recording it. Um, you know, it's uh, the fall of uh, 2022. And uh, the, the thing that's on everyone's mind is the looming recession or the economic challenges, the inflation. And above all, as leaders, you know, how do we build teams that end up staying with us, that end up growing with us, right? And that's harder today than ever before. Um, So I I want to talk about that. Like, how do you do that? I mean, in your experience, how do you build teams that stay? I think the biggest thing is honesty with your staff and the people around you and just being genuine. So I'll be genuine with you now that, you know, it's going to be part for the course of me helping you co-host a show because I've never co-hosted a podcast. So (laughs) I'm going to, I'm going to learn as I go and it's going to be fun. And so I think that vulnerability and the, and the ability to say, I don't know, I think that's, 
more rare because most people want to feel like they always have the answers. And so they don't show that vulnerable side of them. Setting a culture and setting that expectation when you say those things, the people around you understand that, you know what, this person, they actually are genuine. Like they, they want, when I say that I want you to succeed, I really mean it. I'm not just saying that I, to, to tell you what you want to hear so that I can get a little bit more performance out of you. I really, you know, at this point, especially at this point in my career, I feel like, you know, what else can we be successful in? There's so many things to achieve and we've achieved so much. But what I get more enjoyment from is when I actually see the people around me are successful. And, and when you can get to that in your career or just in that mindset, and just, you don't have to wait until you get later in your career, but when you get to that point, you, you get people to start trusting you. And, and, and I hope that the people around me trust me. And, and I try to always make sure that they, they know they can be honest with me because I'm going to be honest with them and we're going to be genuine and we're going to have a genuine respect for each other. Um, so I think, you know, how do you make people stay? I think you make people want to be with you. That way they don't want to leave you uh, because there's so many options out there. So I think that's probably the biggest. If I heard you right, and let me summarize it and you correct me or like add to it as you see fit. The first thing you say it said was honesty or being genuine. And what I heard from that is, and what it, what it reminded me of is um, Jim Collins is a great author. And, and I think there was this professor who mentored him. He was a young kid at Stanford and he said, this 20 year old kid, why don't you teach a class at Stanford? I mean, he was like, you know, teaching yeah. a business class at Stanford, one of the best business schools on the planet. When you are 20, it's pretty daunting. And I think he ended up writing a book about this professor. And I remember reading that book. And there he talks about this particular gentleman trusts everybody by default. Of course, if they lose his trust, then he won't. But he just chooses to trust them, chooses that they can do amazing things, just like Jim Collins, a 20-year-old kid, he thought could do amazing things. And of course, right. Jim Collins didn't disappoint. He ended up becoming one of the best business authors of our time. Uh, you know, he wrote good to great and stuff. So so you, you are kind of like that. You believe in being honest with people. And also the second point you made was all about helping others grow, helping others succeed. So as a leader, your job is to make them successful. If you are focused on making them successful, what I'm hearing you say is your organization will automatically be successful. And it doesn't matter whether it's tough times or easy times, people are going to stay. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the way I look at it is all of the people in the organization and the people that I work with, you know, we're all sitting in this tide pool. And if I can help raise them then that water level is going to continue to rise. And I don't have to do it by myself because I'm just going to float on top of all the success of the people around us. And then the, they're going to do the same thing than the people that work with them or for them. So, you know, it, it is a topic that I think people talk about a lot. I think it's a topic though, that people don't practice as well as they talk about it. And so people need to be honest with themselves about what they think leadership is. And, and I think once you do that, and you really kind of cut to the chase and say, no, it really is about the people that are around me, I think they will start to find more fulfillment in their career, and they'll find more success because there's going to be so many people around them that want to help them, and everything else will just go better because of it. Yeah, you work with a lot of uh, doctors, right? I mean, you are in the yeah. ophthalmology field. Um, so doctors typically have a lot of people who, who, I mean, patients, team members who kind of adore them and look up to them. So how do you be humble and how do you kind of focus on helping others uh, when everyone puts you on this pedestal? A any ex examples, experiences from your, uh, you know, your years of working <laughs> with doctors? Well, I think anybody in this field or any field in medicine knows that, you know, there's all different types of personalities in, in, in medicine. And so there's not a one size fits all approach. And I have had instances where physicians that feel that everything should be catered and directed in, in their specific way, and it is their way of the highway. And I've had other physicians who are on the other side of the spectrum who are the most giving, the most supportive, and are just very open to what it is that you know the business people want to do. Um, so it, it depends on that situation, you know, in those tough cases, I think that, you know, physicians have worked very hard in their careers and, and, and I think we should respect everything that they've done in order to get to that point and, and, and their success. And so should we support them in the way that they need? Absolutely. 
And so I try to, whenever I have a conversation with the physician, I try to let them know that, like, you know, I, I really respect everything that you have accomplished. And just know that everything that we do here is to help support you being successful. And so let me give you the idea of what, of what I think is going to help you be successful. And then I go through and start explaining, you know, how they can support the clinic. So I preface it with, here's how you are going to be successful. And then I, then I list those things of how they can help with that. So, you know, again, I know everybody in this field has had their experience dealing with everybody on that spectrum. Right. So the nugget I got from this, which might apply even beyond physician is focus on helping uh, that person be successful in this case, the physician. So if you can frame everything as a leader in terms of how this will create a win for that person you're talking to, you're going to have a better chance creating change or leading that team. That's right. Yeah. Because it's easy to become frustrated. And I think what sometimes is, you know, people in the field or in medicine and ophthalmology get in the habit of doing is if you have people who make a mistake or somebody who didn't do a workup exam exactly how you wanted it to be done, the the fault reaction can sometimes be frustration. Hey, why didn't you do that? You know, so anytime you come at someone in an aggressive manner, human nature is they're always going to have a defensive stance and try right. to try to say, well, no, you know, give excuses of why that didn't happen. And so when I try to coach the physicians and also coach managers is to approach it, just use different word, say, you know, you know, thank you for, you know, you point out the part of the exam they did correct. Yeah. Thank you for doing the, the refraction. That was spot on. Thank you for that. It was great. Um, here's what I think is going to help you next time you see a patient in this instance, make sure you take this exam. And if you have any questions about, you know, next time you have that kind of a patient, let me know and I'll, and I'll help guide you through it. So whenever you say that or approach it that way, the staff then, because I've seen this, I've seen this with different physicians throughout the years, ones who approach it that way, they, they actually have teams of people who are rushing to support them. And then ones who are more tyrants and they think that they're going to roll an iron fist, then they have people that are afraid of them and they do just enough not to get in trouble, but they don't have people, they don't have a team of people behind them really thinking of them and supporting them. So I think that physicians that are trying to approach, you know, how do I approach my staff and what's that strategy going to be should really consider, you know, what I've seen on the back end of what, you know, being a tyrant versus being supportive, what kind of uh, reaction that gets. Right. So just to summarize, a supportive person starts with something the person is doing right. And then on top of that, shares any constructive ways for that person to improve. So people, okay. like it's almost like now the person wants to listen because you're on their side. They feel like you are noticing the things they're doing right. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, then you're suggesting, you know, what else can be done to improve things, right? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is awesome. So you gave a lot of leadership tips. Let's just switch gears for a minute. Let's talk about um, culture. What is culture? Why is it important? And then once we figure that stuff out, let's get into how to do it right. Let's start with what is culture and why is it important, especially in 2022? Yeah, culture, it, it's one of those things that's hard, hard to define, but the best way that I can define it is it's, it's the way that you decide to treat each other and your patients, right? And so at the end of the day, what is, you know, so when we try to define our culture, you know, we try to come up with simple ways to explain it. And the simplest way that we've come up with is we treat our staff and our patients like family. You know, family you like, <laughs> maybe maybe it's not that person that you don't like, but it's it, you, we treat them like family. So the, that way we can use a simple statement to explain the behaviors and the culture that we're looking for in the organization. So if you were your your brother or your cousin, and they came in for an exam, you probably would, you know, if there was an issue or even before there was an issue, you'd probably give them a little extra, you know, time or attention, or, you know, you would make sure that they had a great outcome. So we use that statement to, to, to let them know, this is how every patient should be treated because every patient that comes in the door is somebody's brother. They're someone's cousin. It could be you. Think of yourself in the situation as the patient. Treat them 
how you would want to treat family or yourself. So I think that it, to, to try to explain culture, we could talk about you know many different things, but that's the easiest way I can explain it. Makes sense. Now it's everybody throws around the buzzword culture. Uh, everybody talks about it, but I, I I haven't seen too many people doing it right. What's your experience in ophthalmology, and how do you actually now? Let's talk about how do you get everyone to understand what your organization's culture is and then how do you actually live it you know like let's get into the nuts and bolts of culture well i think culture it starts from the top so we we are very fortunate to to have a, a founder and an owner that culture is his most important topic that he talks about anytime that you see him he, you see him and you walk next to him and he he asks you about the culture. He says, here's what we're trying to do. And, and so we're fortunate that our, our, our owner and our leadership feels that way. So I think it, then it, in the executive team, you know, we have had people on the, on the team now that that's the kind of people that he attracted. And so that further is a culture. And then we as executive team then have managers and others that we feel represent those same values. And then, so it's really about getting the right people that share those values because I can't come into a room and say, here's the culture organization. If your values are completely different than mine and there's no way that I'm, you know, it's, you know, can you learn culture and values? Sure you can, but we try to find people that are similar and have similar values to us that make it easier for us to, to spread the culture. Cause really you're right. People, it's a buzzword. You can you can just say it, but that doesn't mean anything. You can put it on a on a poster and you can stick it in the, the kitchen, but that's not going to change anything. It's about how you act in, as an individual, as a human, as a leader that defines that. And so, you know, if you have that from the top and it starts and it continues its way down, then you're going to be much more successful. Absolutely. So coming back, you said um, your owner, uh, you know, believes in culture and he talks about what your culture is and he he lives it. And uh, then he attracts people who have the same values, the same belief, like, you know, we want to treat patients and our team like we would treat family. It's pretty simple. I mean, you can say that in a few seconds, right? right. Uh, and then he he talks about it, he focuses on it. So let's get into the nuts and bolts. You said, instead of trying to change people to believe what we believe, we try to find people who believe what we believe. So how do you do that? I mean, you have, I'm sure had at least one person, probably a ton of people. So yeah. how do you find well, people, you know, who believe, uh, you know, in treating everyone else, like your team and your patients, like family? So finding those people. So I, I, I'm not going to lie and tell you that I have the magic touch and can pick every perfect person <laughs> out of a bunch. But what we have done is we've grown most of our leadership within the organization is grown from within so we've had an opportunity to see these people grow and who they are and you know the values that they have and how they treat other people around them and so that's why i'd say probably 80 to 90 percent of our leadership are people from within i think if you have a culture that's so strong like that once you bring people from the outside you, it's pretty easy to see. You can see the contrast when you bring someone in who maybe won't fit the culture of the organization because it's so defined and so strong. When you can, when you talk to people, you get a, you start getting a feel. And this is goes now more so less technical, but it's more in your gut of, you know, this person would be a great fit for our organization culturally, and you start to as you get stronger and you go, you get, you get better at it. Am I perfect? No, but you know, I think that we do a pretty good job of trying to figure out, I think what I told, you know, when I, one of our, one of my other great leaders and he was going to look to hire somebody and I told him, you know, whenever you're looking for people, just, is this the kind of person you want to go grab a beer with? You know, is this the kind of person you'd want to spend your time with? Because guess what? We're going to spend hours and hours every day together. And if you don't if you see yourself wanting to spend time with that person, you probably don't want to hire them because, you know, they may not reflect the values that we have here. But if you do, then it's a good chance that they're going to be successful and we can all grow together. So I love this idea of, you know, promoting internally. I mean, we have a 200 plus person organization and every leader in the company started out as a, you know, entry level or, a, you know, 
like a junior person in the company in that particular role. And then they grew and they grew and they grew. And I think it's really powerful when you have an organization that's grows from within, as opposed to you quote unquote, bring in experts who have a lot of quote unquote experience. And then you plug them in and hope they magically make things happen. It doesn't work that way. I mean, a lot of, I mean, most successes are overnight success decades in the making. So I totally understand and appreciate what you're saying. And I I agree with you hundred percent. Now kind of let's switch gears. Now we talked about why is culture important? And, And I think when you're going through a crisis, like, you know, the, the pandemic or the inflation, the, you know, the, I'm sure a lot of practices have, you know, challenges keeping people and meeting, you know, hiring people. So when you're going through these tough times, let's call it crises, how does culture help you? Well, I think that, you know, the first part of our conversation was how do, how do you build it, right? Like, how do you mm-hmm. start growing leaders to, to share that? And so I think that's the important part of getting through a crisis like the COVID pandemic. If you're trying to build an organization that people want to be in and you're trying to do it during the COVID pandemic, <laughs> it's going to be hard to do that. So you have to start building your organization today because when you get into those situations where, you know, there's some tough calls that have to be made, you know, we're going to have to, we're going to have to close for a month, two months, three months, and, you know, we're going to try to figure it out. But if you have that foundation where people already trust you, they're less likely to go. Now we know that people come to work to get paid. So, but they also come to work and for fulfillment, they, they want to be with in a place that they enjoy and, and people they trust. So, you know, during the pandemic, when we had to do certain things to keep the business running, we already had a foundation where we could be honest with them of why we were doing certain things. I think sometimes organizations try to shirk from telling, you know, them the, the whole truth of what we're doing. But I think in our case, we had such a great relationship. We could say, you know, we're, we're, we're here's what we're doing. We're going to, you know, close this amount of time, but here's how we're going to help you financially. And, you know, here's what the organization looks like. And here's how much we can sustain without patients. And our goal is to start seeing patients here. And so we, as you start laying those things out, you know, we had very minimal, very minimal loss of staff during that time. And I think it was because of, of how much work that we did throughout the previous years, you know, developing that foundation you know, there, there were other things that were uncontrollable, like family members who had uh, children at home or people they needed to take care of or people that, you know, were wanted to decide to go into different industries. But comparing our turnover to other ophthalmology practices, you know, we, we, we think head and shoulders, we, we lost way fewer staff. And, I, and I, we attribute that to the foundation that we built um, because when those tough times come, you're going to have to call upon those people that you've supported. And so that's going to be the true test of, you know, how well did you take care of them when times were good? Makes sense. Let's switch gears and let's talk about leadership styles. And also we know that not all leadership styles will work for every situation. You have to have different leadership styles for different situations. How do you think of leadership styles? What are leadership styles in your mind? I think this is a a really important topic, especially for everyone, but especially for newer leaders and managers coming in to the field or coming into a new position or, or just getting into the position now where you have people that report to you. Um, I know when I started, I, I was very unsure of, you know, I, I just tried to be myself and I mentioned that I was just honest and genuine, but, you know, I, I think you start questioning yourself of, Am I being too soft? And then, you know, you're, you're a little, you're, you're, you can't be their friend. Like you can't go out and drink with them every day. That's not, that's not, that's not the right way to approach it because then they won't hold a respect for you. And then you start being a little too soft and then you think, okay, well, I need to turn it on and I need to be a little, little more strict. And then you start questioning yourself. Was I too strict? Did I not listen? And so early in my career, you know, I would, I kind of ran the whole gamut of different leadership styles. Um, There's a great article from uh, Daniel Goleman from the uh, Harvard Business Review. Um, It's called Leadership That Gets Results. And when I read that article, it was the first time that I really understood myself 
because I felt like before I was a flip flopper because I would sometimes be soft. I would sometimes be strict. I would sometimes get people's opinion. I would sometimes uh, just make a decision unilaterally. And, and after reading that article, it kind of clicked for me because I felt that, oh, well, wait a second. There, there is not one leadership style that you can use as a leader all the time and it's the perfect style. You actually have to adapt to the situation. And so the article talks about emotional intelligence and the ability to um, have self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and social skill, and all the things that go into understanding situations, understanding people. So if people can work on their emotional intelligence, and that's understanding when to use different styles, then they can apply the different leadership styles when that time comes um, you know, for that type of style that's going to get the best results. And, and so Again, like I was so thankful to read that because I felt like I was a flip flopper in my styles. But after reading it, I'm like, well, you know what? I was just being adaptive. And I think that what leaders have to do is they have to be adaptive. They have to read the room. They have to know when to show that unilateral leadership and make decisions and when to get input. Yeah, let's spend a minute or two on each leadership style just so that people know what we are talking about. So again, you can download that article. I think it's a few bucks at, uh, from Harvard. Uh, it's a wonderful article, um, leadership that gets results. So uh, Daniel Goldman talks about six leadership styles. By the way, I'm a big fan of these, uh, this yep. particular article and the six leadership styles. The first one is called the authoritative visionary leader. Um, so they're in Inspiring. And uh, so can you give me an example of when that leadership style might be effective? This is a leadership style that's it's like a come with me approach. So the leader states the goal and then, you know, then the people figure out how to follow them. I, I think it depends. Like there's that authoritative style would probably be useful during a time of crisis where you have to make a decision very fast. Like, I, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of 9-11 and the mayor of New York. Uh, yes. What's his name? Um, I can't remember. Uh, Rudy Giuliani. Giuliani at that time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like he was like, he was on the grounds, like, you know, he was just leading it, you know, and everybody just rallied behind him and said, we'll support you. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And he had to do that because the time was of, of the essence. Like right. he, there wasn't time to get all the opinions and think about it. And, you know, you got to make decisions. And so there's times in your career in leadership where you need to be authoritative and, and, and just make that gut call. Right. Let's talk about the next one. The next one is called the coaching leader. Yeah. Yeah. It, that style focuses mostly on, I think, personal development. And so this is the, you know, it works well when, you know, employees are aware of their weaknesses and want to improve. And so this is when you have maybe shyer, newer people to your industry and you know you don't want to scare them out of the field you need to coach them and so when they're especially when they're open to it so if you have newer maybe coming from different industries like optometry that never refract or different things like that i think when when they're ready that coaching style works really well when they're open to it let's could talk about um, the affiliative leader so the affiliative style it's um you know it's like a it's more of the a lot of what I described in terms of our culture, it's a people come first attitude. And I think that is probably, you know, has one of the higher correlations to a successful leadership because that is applicable in many situations. And so it's very similar to the style that I, that I listed to say, hey, we're going to support you. We're going to make sure that we do everything we can to give you the tools necessary to, to do your job and be successful. And I think it's probably that style. It's probably the bulk of the style that I use. Um, and it works really well when you have the right people with you. Democratic leader. Yeah, democratic style, you know, obviously what it sounds like, it's, you know, you let's say that in, in, you have a decision that, you know, depending on the decision that you make, that you're going to have people with strong opinions one way or the other and you have the time to do that analysis, I think that's a great time to use a democratic style. Um, you know, so I you use want that people's buy-in so you get their buy-in right from the beginning. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. I've used that style. And, you know, it's it's kind of funny because I, I read this article first in my, when, in my first year of my MBA program and I was able to use it 
pretty much like right when I read the article, I had a situation come up that, you know, I referred to the, to the, to the article here and I was like, okay, well, when do I need to, what style do I need to use in this situation? It was a couple different physicians and some managers that had differing opinions. And so I used this democratic approach and was able to get them to come to a compromise and everyone bought into the decision. And so it was really nice to see that, you know, hey, you know what, <laughs> this stuff works. So that, that's a great example of, of when to use it whenever you think people will have strong opinions on the outcome and you have enough time to do that analysis. Perfect. Pace setting leader. You know, the pace setting leader, I think should be used very sparingly um, because it doesn't allow enough space for others to grow because it's the type of leader who knows everything about the process and they are setting the pace, you know? So if, you know, so in most situations, I think you as a leader need to set that pace, but you need to give the people that are working for you the opportunity to be successful and not expect everyone to always keep your pace because you're in a leadership position for a reason and you are a very high performer. So if anyone, the definition of success is only to be as good as you are in everything that you're in, then you may be disappointed and you may frustrate others. So there are times that it's useful, but I try to use it very sparingly. Yeah, I mean, one person I can think of is Jack Welch, who ran GEs, right? So it's all about your division has to be one or two in the industry. If not, we sell it or we kill it. Uh, the bottom 10% gets purged every year. Like, so the bottom yep. 10% of the employees get, you know, asked to, you know, see you bye-bye. So that's kind of pace setting, right? You set a very high standard and you expect everyone to kind of keep up. Right. Which right. it can work and it. It definitely works. It's just, I think you just have to be careful not to overwhelm right. people. Right. Uh, the commanding or the coercive leader. That's probably... Um, you know, that's the probably stick the next approach. Level is it up. like, like, you know, here is a stick, here is a stick. So you better right. not do this. That's right. The, and, right. And I think that also has a slightly lower correlation to the driver, driver, drivers of success in business. But, but there are times when if the, if the business is floating, if the business is adrift and has no direction, then you need to be coercive. And, and that's the do what I say approach. And so there's going to be times in a business, you know, situation or history that you may need to take that approach. We covered all six leadership styles. Um, let's, uh, you know, let's, I think we are coming to a close. Uh, any final thoughts as we wrap this up, Guido? You know, I, I think that all of us in, in every field, but we're talking about ophthalmology and I think we all have similar struggles. We have similar challenges, you know, industry challenges, uh, staffing challenges, um, reimbursement challenges. The one secret weapon that I think we have that we don't utilize enough is the ability to lead and create a strong culture. And I think sometimes it's overlooked. And so if we as leaders can figure out how to get the most from everything that we do by supporting the people that help us do it, I think we're more likely to get through all these challenges because I hear it when we go to meetings and we talk to different leaders across the country. You know, we all have the same struggles. It, it, it almost feels like you're looking in the mirror sometimes when you talk about the challenges you have in your practice. And so I think it's, and, and we should lean on each other and ask questions and support each other, listen to podcasts like this so that you can get a different perspective and ideas or, or just sometimes know that other people are in the same boat and it's going to be okay. And, and so hopefully this forum will allow us the opportunity to do that, to connect and to help each other through those struggles as they come up. Thank you so much, Guido, for joining us today and talking to us about leadership in tough, challenging times. We appreciate it very much. And personally, I learned a lot. I mean, you, are, you have experience and it definitely shows from the way you spoke and the insights you shared. So thank you so much. I also want to take a moment to thank our listeners. We appreciate each and every one of you. We cannot do what we do without you. If you like our podcast, kindly share it with your friends and on social media. 
Also, please don't forget to write a review for us on iTunes or Google Play. Your reviews will help other doctors and practice owners find us. Till we meet again, wishing all of you an amazing week ahead.